Welcome to A Century of Service, Stories of Alberta's Military History. My name is Ian Parkinson, and I'm here today with an ex-member of the Royal Canadian Air Force, Mr. Tom Thompson, who served in World War II. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Ian. So where were you born and raised, Tom? In Winnipeg, in Manitoba. And you were raised there as well? Yes. What year were, what year were you born? Uh, 1923. 1923. So, you've, did you graduate from school? I got enough high school to get me on the workforce. Okay, so what did you work at before you joined the military? I was a clerk in the insurance business in Winnipeg. Okay. So what, decide, what made you decide to join the military? Well, well, there was a war on. It became obvious in 1939 that that was going to be my future, was the service. And I think that was the attitude of almost all high school boys at that time. So when did you join the military and what was your experience like? I joined the Air Force in June of 1942 okay. and uh, proceeded on a fast trip of training to become a, a gunner and uh, I was ready for, to uh, leave home and go overseas and which I did on Christmas Day in 1942. So prior to Christmas of 1942, the day you signed your um, conscription papers, I guess, or your, where did you, where did you go first? To uh, Manning Depot in uh, Brandon, Manitoba, okay. where we learned how to march. Everybody seems to do that. Everybody does. Did. <laughs> so that was your first taste of the military. What was that like? Well, it was... Uh, I, was I didn't have any trouble with uh, following the orders of how to march and where to march, etc. I don't know why. Maybe Boy Scouts taught me something. Ah, uh -huh, you were a Boy Scout, yes. Yeah, I was. So once your initial boot camp, for a better word, we, was over, where did you go next? From there we went to gunnery school, which was in McDonald, Manitoba. Okay, what were you flying? Uh, ferry battles. The, the discards of the British Empire. Definitely. So you train, what kind of training did you get in these ferry battles? Well, uh, there you learn how to fire a gas-fired Lewis machine gun. I think that was the right name. Yep. And uh, taking shots at a drogue that was being told by another aircraft. So now, the, now that you've had your basic air gunner training, what came next? Posting overseas. Oh. So how did you get overseas? Well, I went to uh, Halifax, where crews were uh, air crews were gathering from all over Canada and then uh, waiting for a ship to take us across the ocean. Now, did you leave from Halifax or from somewhere else? No, we were in a train. We didn't know where we were going, but we knew it soon that we were heading south and then the uh, going through the 
the United States and went to New York and left from the train directly into the ship that we were going across the ocean on. So the ship would be the, the old Queen Mary? Uh, no, it was, the QE was afloat at that time, was it not? Yes. Yep. Uh, so you sail from New York. How many of you are on this ship? I think there was 20,000. That's a lot of boisterous young men. Loaded with Americans. There were about 2,000 Canadian airmen on board. So the, uh, the trip was fast, but uh, about two days on the ocean, and all of a sudden, boy, it's warm here because we were near the Azores. Yes. And uh, the ship was fast enough that it could maneuver away from uh, submarines who would love to have sunk her. <laughs> okay, so how many, how many days was it between New York and wherever you landed in the United Kingdom? Uh, I think we landed on the sixth day. That was a fast trip. Yeah. So where did you land? Gorick, out uh, near Glasgow. Okay. So where did you go from there? And down to uh, Bournemouth on the south coast of England, where it was uh, all the Canadians, air crew, went there, and we, it being a resort area, where they had some nice hotels to yeah. live in. So did you receive any training while you were in Bournemouth? No. No. We were just waiting for further posting to uh, other. So after, after Bournemouth then, where was your next posting? Where was your next base? We were, went to uh, Lossiemouth in okay. the north of Scotland to... Uh, operational training unit and flying in Wellington bombers and there we formed a cruise the pilot would find a navigator and and uh, go down the line more or less and I was uh, then going to be a tail gunner Okay, so you're now a trained tail gunner in a Wellington at Lossiemouth. Yeah. Where were you posted from Lossiemouth? To uh, operational training unit just out of York. Okay. Uh, and the con it, they called them conversion units uh, because we were converting to another aircraft and it was called a Halifax, a four-engine. Right. Bomber. So now you're a qualified air gunner in the four-engined Halifax, and where did you get posted from there? Eventually, uh, we were po I was uh, posted to uh, Sneath, 51 Squadron, uh, still in Yorkshire. Any fond memories of your time in Northern England and Scotland? I always thought that York, Yorkshire was a, a beautiful country. Uh, and we had uh, lots of leave time in, in the city of York and Leeds. And uh, eventually, uh, we're crewed up with uh, a New Zealand Air Force pilot 
who had done 22 operations. So this guy's a veteran. He's a veteran, yeah. Now, there's, there's, there's a little bit more to this story because he's not just from New Zealand. Um, Johnny Poe is actually a Maori. Like he's a, right. a native Kiwi. Yes. So you've actually got quite a mixed crew. Um, you have a, a Maori pilot. You've got a Canadian tail gunner. Um, what about the rest of your crew? Where are they from? They were all Brits, RAF. You didn't have any difficulty understanding each other? No. So now you've, you've got this mixed crew. You're all trained and ready to go. Um, how many, how many f raids were you involved in before your next exciting story? Well, I had two trips over France. Uh, I'm trying to find the word. Uh, we would often send out bombers in a route that would uh, indicate to the German that we were going to the Ruhr Valley, we'll say, right. where in fact they were going some, maybe the real bombers were going to Berlin. Uh, you, were, you were trying to throw them off? Yeah. Now, these raids were also done at night. Oh, uh, yep. The RAF never flew anything but night bombing. Okay. So after your first two successful, after your first two successful raids, how was your third one? A disaster. <laughs> yeah, we got shot down, down by uh, anti-aircraft shells over Hanover, and the uh, four of the crew bailed out, three of us were still in the aircraft when Johnny Poe got it leveled out and flying straight, and uh, we then had hopes of flying back in maybe putting it down in the North, ditching in the North Sea, where be close enough to Britain to get picked up. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. We had ended up flying uh, across uh, Holland and Belgium and down the English Channel. And when Johnny decided that he had to put it down because of the fuel and figured that we were heading too far. Uh, he ditched it and uh, we came down in the channel just off Brest. Okay, now why did you stay with the plane rather than parachute? Well, we had no intercom, it was shot up, so I didn't know what was going on up front. Uh, I couldn't, uh, tail gunner's parachute is inside the fuselage of the aircraft. It's not on, in the turret. But I, I couldn't open the doors from the turret into the fuselage. But by the time uh, it became obvious that I wasn't, wasn't going to get out, I uh, Johnny had, flo had uh, put the craft into a dive situation which put the fire out that was in the starboard in a, in indoor inside uh, motor. But once he got it 
down a few thousand feet, they leveled it off. Then I communicated with the pilot that I was still in the aircraft. And the bomb aimer, who was still there, came back and uh, assisted me in getting out of the uh, turret. So Johnny Poles put the plane down in the North Sea, just north of Brest, off the coast of France. Yeah. The three of you are now in a dinghy floating around basically in the English Channel. Right. Uh, cold, wet, miserable, hungry. I'm probably wondering what's going to happen next. Well, the question was, where were we? And how close to Britain? Well, then come dawn, we were looking at the coast of France to the south of the earth of us. Could only be France. Mm -hmm. So we just relaxed in the dinghy and hoping somebody's going to come along on a boat and pick us up. So who did eventually pick you up? A German aircraft came over and spotted us, came down to have a look at us, and then uh, notified their base, and out came uh, a, a boat to pick us up. So the boat fishes the three out of you, wet airmen out of the English Channel. What happened next? We were never wet. No? Oh. <laughs> we, uh, you got over the aircraft from a, a top of a dome that pops off, and you walk along the wing. Okay. And the dinghy comes out of a pod in the wing. And uh, we just <laughs> step in it and... Okay. So once the German boat picked the three of you up, what happened then? Well, they took us into their base at uh, Brest in France, and then sometime about the middle of the night, I think they roasted us out, and we were, went by train to Frankfurt and in Germany. Okay. Now, this wasn't a, uh, this wasn't the first class passenger train. Uh, train like? That train was. Oh, it was. Okay. Oh, it was a passenger train. So we were just in with the the civilians. Uh, at Frankfurt, it was an interrogation center, and uh, they knew all about us because it was four of our crew were already captured two couple of days previous. Okay. So we were split up. Johnny was an officer, so he was sent to uh, Stalaglo 6, or 3, which was an officer's camp. And Dave Wells, the bombardier, bomb aimer, by my, and myself were sent to uh, Stalag Luft 6 in, in East Prussia. That is northeast Germany. Right. To Stalag Luft uh, uh, 6. So, what was Stalag Luft, what was it like, and who were the majority of the prisoners? It was uh, strictly. Strictly Air Force, all, they were all allied uh, forces, that is, Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, and uh, it was uh, very well organized, uh, and I might say it was democratic in that we elected a representative to, from our 
section, and uh, they in turn would appoint a uh, the people who would run run the camp. Okay. Uh, as far as we could, we could go as prisoners. Like there was a head, one of our boys was looked after the, the Red Cross parcels okay. and the food. Another one who was handled the escape uh, organization. And then there was a person who was the, the top representative of all the prisoners. Now his name was Dixie Dean in our camp. And he uh, spoke fluent German. He had worked in Berlin with the telephone mm. organization. So he, he was a really, uh, had a great reputation amongst POWs. So how did you fill your time in Stalaglov 6? Well, we did a lot of walking around the perimeter of the of the prison, the logger as they call it, that we were in. Read every book that they had in the library. And there wasn't too many of those. There were groups who organized entertainment. You could always find an orchestra amongst the uh, the prisoners. You got to believe that there is. So they were mainly R A. RAF types. They were well educated people. I don't include myself with that <laughs> group, but there were people who were professors, and uh, s s most of them um, trained in some profession. Right. So we were, as I say, had great entertainment from these people. Now, you were also wounded when you were shot down. Yeah. I took some flack in my face and my arm and my lower left egg, leg. So you, you were treated while you were in Stella Glove 6 as well? Yes. Yes, we had... There was a hospital there run by prisoners. The doctors, I think there were two of them. They were uh, British Army doctors, probably taken in North Africa or, okay. or stayed with their troops because they needed a doctor, with, yes. even so they knew they were going to be prisoners. So it's now the fall winter of um, 43, you're in Luff 6. Uh, you're now headed into the spring of 1944, and obviously the invasion of Europe. Um, how did you guys know what was going on? We had a radio connection with uh, with Britain and uh, illegal of course as far as the Germans were concerned but it was called the canary and uh, nobody knew where the pieces were to this radio except they'd all get together to operate and have a certain time that they would get messages from Great Britain. Some of them in code. I wasn't involved in it, so I'm talking about, 
about something I really don't know a heck of a lot about. But uh, daily, a representative of the news organization would come to the hut and read the news to us. Ah. So we knew what was going on. As far as the invasion of uh, D-Day, and uh, that's the 6th of June, hey, eh? yep. 44. Uh, we knew about it just as quick as any of the Germans in the camp. <laughs> so we thought that, oh, well, that's great. Now, during this time, too, your Maori pilot actually winds up being, I'm, I'm led to believe, part of the Great Escape. Yes, he was. Uh, the, this is a sad story, but what happened to Johnny Poy? Well, Johnny was one of the members of the Great Escape who got out of the camp. There were many of them ready to go because there were 200 who were slated to go. 72 got out. And he and uh, Australia, they were just, uh, they had civilian clothes or what appeared to be civilian clothes and they headed, headed south thinking that they were going to go to uh, Romania right. or whatever's down there. But they were captured. But the idea was of the mass of the escape uh, was to involve as many German troops looking for right. just as many as possible and for as long as possible. But uh, Johnny was, Hitler was very uh, upset of course about this massive escape and uh, he, his order was that every one of them would be shot well, they ended up uh, deciding that 50 would be shot. Unfortunately, Johnny Poe was one of the 50, and he was shot. Hmm. A sad day for everybody. Oh, yes, yes. So now we move into the sp late spring, early summer of 1944. Uh, you're still in Luff 6, but things are about to change, I'm led to believe. What happened then? Yes, the Russians were advancing in from the east, so uh, they decided to move us, and we were moved out. We went to uh, a place called Thorn in Poland and uh, into a camp that was... Uh, a British military uh, prison camp. So you started this, they've obviously, how, how did they move you out of Luft 6? In what we call a, a cattle cars. Okay. Uh, during the first war, they called them 40 by eight, so that's 40 men and eight horses. But uh, they, we were moved and crowded into them. They'd get as many possible into one car, uh, carriage. So they moved you, they're moving you through Poland. Yes. And where did you eventually wind up? Uh, well, we were there for maybe uh, three weeks or a month. And of course, the Russians were coming into the other side of Poland. Uh, by the way, we had Polish airmen with us who right. had escaped from Poland and got to Britain and joined the RAF, but they were... Uh, Shot down and captured. Yeah, they were captured. 
but uh, when they got to this camp in Poland, before you know it, they're walking up and down the line, and friends of theirs were on the other side. Well, guess what happened that night? Over the wire. <laughs> so things, uh, I think 13 of them went out, and, they, and boom, they're into the Polish um, community. Oh, the underground. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, they got us out of there with this British uh, army element that were in the camp, and we went to a place called Falling Bossel, south of Bremen, okay. center of Germany, and we were in a prison camp there. Now, things must be pretty confusing at this time because you've got the Russians coming in from the north and the east, You've got the Allies coming in from the South and the West. Yeah. You've got massive confusion. You've got troops running around all over the place. And then you have this large group of prisoners of war somewhere in the middle. Yes. And I don't imagine that was a very comfortable day. How did you wind up being liberated? We were uh, in a farming village, sleeping in the barns and near, can't think of the name of the town. Anyway, it's on the Elbe River. Okay. And this, we're just north of Lubeck, which is on the North Sea. And the, uh, German troops that were supposed to be guarding us were, they seemed to be disappearing. <laughs> and I think they said, mother lives down the road, I'm going home. <laughs> but anyway, uh, one morning there's a, we hear a shot, so we find that he, a British, uh, Lieutenant in a jeep driven by a British corporal. They were our liberators. Mm. And the few Germans that were around there, they gladly gave up their arms and, and uh, got their hands over their heads. From there, it was a case of us, us on our own, uh, getting out uh, across the Elbe River, where the we were told that the British Army was there. Uh, so we found our way over there by wagons and then a truck that we were able to liberate. Uh, and got to uh, the uh, uh, an army base that was there, where we were checked out to make sure we were were what we said we were, and then waited for uh, transportation to get us further across Germany. So how did you, you, you got from Germany, they move you into France. Um, you must have done a fair amount of walking at this point. No, once we were liberated, we were just waited for uh, transport. Allied transport and they trucked us across to uh, Bel Belgium. Right. And from there, we eventually, uh, after two or three days, uh, got aircraft coming in and pick us up and take us back to Great Britain. So now you're back in the United Kingdom. 
Um, what happened at that point? We were, Canadians were all uh, trucked down to uh, Bournemouth. Uh, goodness knows where the RAF types went, but the nearest base that had a food and accommodation, I guess. So then we were given, after getting clothed and fed, and uh, they gave us a, a holiday uh, a pass and a train ticket. So uh, I was heading back up to uh, Scotland to where my, some of my relatives still lived. And uh, two boys that we were together all, all our time in Germany. Uh, Wally Greensides from Assiniboine, Saskatchewan, and Harry O'Brien from Regina. I said, "We, well, you got nobody to go and visit. Come on with me. We'll go up to uh, Scotland." Firstly, we had to go to. We su they suggested that we go to Canada House in London. Okay. Where all mail two prisoners was accumulated and held because there was no way they could, no transportation in Germany. So we got in there and well, they said we couldn't keep parcels. Uh, see, our folks could send parcels to us in Germany. Right. But uh, they couldn't uh, hold them because a lot of them contained uh, food items, you know, mother's favorite Christmas pudding and that sort of thing. But they said, we'll give you whatever you want. So they gave us each a duffel bag and cigarettes piled in, candy, some socks and all different things. Yeah. So, but the cigarettes, of course, were the prime thing. I was stupid enough to smoke in those days when I got, had them. Well, the cigarettes were a form of currency in the prison camps. Oh, I yeah, right. definitely. I was, when I first got into the camp in um, Luft 6, um, the fellows in the next logger or area that is fenced off were coming over to the wire and we were talking to them and they were all asking us how's this, that, and happening in the, at home. So I, I knew there was a fellow in prison camp uh, there was uh, a friend of my oldest brother, mm. so uh, Fraser, Fraser Eady. So I said, is there a guy named Fraser Eady in, this, in your lab? Yeah, sure, just when I'll get him. <laughs> Away he goes and comes back. And Fraser didn't know me, right. but he knew my brother. Huh? So we chatted for a while and asking about different people in the Fort Rouge area of Winnipeg. And, uh, and he says, uh, do, you, do you want some cigarettes? I said, yeah, I'll give you some. So he goes back to his, where he lived and come back and he, we used to get cartons of a, a thousand cigarettes. And he threw one over the fence to me. Well, I, I was an immediate millionaire. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you're in 
Bournemouth. You're still wounded. Obviously, you've still got shrapnel working its way out. But you've been cl you're clean, you're clothed, you've been fed. You got a chance to visit family in Scotland. Yeah. Okay, what happened after that? Well, we had been in uh, Scotland for uh, a week, maybe 10 days. And all of a sudden, there's a telegraph come home, <laughs> or back to Bournemouth. Okay. So we had to catch the next train on back to Bournemouth, and then a couple of days, and we were uh, bust, or I can't remember how we got there. I went over to Southampton and got on a, a ship, the Louis Pasteur. Uh, to come across the ocean. We were, uh, there was uh, all uh, sleeping accommodation was in the hammocks. The, uh, so how many days did it take you to get home? Well, to back to Canada from Southampton. I was going to say that the Louis Pasteur, these as we got on board, we were in three deck hammocks and crowded as could be. Well, there's a whole bunch of fellows who had married British, British girls, okay. and they had only seen them for uh, three or four days. And uh, then they get sent to that. Well, a whole bunch of them said, to hell with you, I'm going. I'm not going on this ship. And they walked off it. Of course, the, whoever was in charge just well, went crazy. All these guys walking off. Right. And uh, there was a Canadian broadcaster in Britain and uh, working for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And he had set a desk up down at the foot of the gangplank. And he was talking to people as he looked, and all of a sudden these fellows that were refusing to go home on it because they had family there or some of them had girlfriends that they intended to marry and all this. So he was all on our side. Before you know it, all, everybody on board was over on the the dock side of the ship and the Louis Pasteur was starting to lean. <laughs> then there's another panic. Get back to the other side, because those are uh, cruise ships off the Mediterranean that are kind of round bottomed, I think. Eh? They're, they're not ocean going ships. By not ocean. Stretch, no. <laughs> anyway, it was ocean going and we were in the North Atlantic and headed for Canada. And uh, so, where did the Louis Pasteur drop you off? Hal uh, Halifax. Halifax. Yep. And then you were shipped from Halifax. Halifax. We were trained to Montreal, and we were in Montreal for maybe a week, no, three or four days, and then a train home to Winnipeg. Now, judging by your biography from this morning, you were promoted on your way home. Yes, somewhere along the line they decided I should be commissioned. And so you wound, up, you wound up going home as a pilot officer? Yes. Okay. So pilot officer Thompson now lands up back in Winnipeg. Yep. Kind of a welcome did you get? Oh, it was great. The whole family were in the CPR station just to meet me. And yeah, it was nice to see them. Now, at this point in time, I mean, here now we're talking, what, June, July of 1945, you're still actually in service. Yes. Uh, what was the reason they hung on to you? 
Well, the war in Japan was still going on, and uh, I think that the forces didn't quite know what to do. I know that Navy ships were heading to uh, the South Atlantic, South Pacific, and Australia. There's a, a Joyce Condon who dines with me in the uh, uh, River Ridge. Okay. The she one. was in the Wrens. Ah. British Wrens. Okay. So. And she went, they shipped them to Australia because they figured, you know, there's going to be more, there was more war to be fought over in right. the South Pacific. So then VGA Day was, was it sometime in August, I believe? Yes. Right, so now the war in the Asia is over. So what happens to pilot officer Tom Thompson then? Well, I was, uh, I think I was in, Deer Lodge Hospital about that time. So they're still picking pieces of the Wellington. Yeah, out of well, here. they had a piece in here and they had the operator on here to get it out because it was affecting the nerves of the hand. Right. And I, come September, I was discharged. Eh? Then I went back to school for a while. Okay, yeah. When did you meet your wife? Oh, somebody threw a party and she was... The girls were looking for men to come home, you know. So she was in, included in as a guest and I took her home afterwards and courted her for a year or so, and then we were married in June of 47. And this is still in Winnipeg? Yes. Okay, how did you wind up in Medicine Hat? Moved to uh, Calgary in uh, 49, October 49, and I worked for an organization, uh, and I the nicest thing about it was they gave me a brand new Ford to drive. <laughs> but I had to drive it from Medicine Hat to Grand Prairie, Bonneville, St. Paul, oh. And the day that I was uh, driving from Stetler to Coronation, and it was 35 below, and I was the only one on the road. I uh, decided I would find another situation <laughs> and came down here to Medicine Hat. And you've been here ever since? Yes. Do you have any fond memories of your time in the Royal Canadian Air Force? Fond memories. I guess my association with uh, the boys from Saskatchewan, Wally Greensides and Harry O'Brien, was one of the best things that could happen to a young fella. Uh, Wally was so old he was married. And, uh, and we kept in touch with one another Unfortunately, they both passed away and it's quite some time ago now, but they were uh, the kind of people that you were glad in later years that you were exposed to them yeah. and, and you learned something.
Do you have any memories of Johnny Poi? Okay, the Maori community in uh, New Zealand uh, decided that they would make a documentary about Johnny Poi, oh. who was the first Maori airman to fly with over Germany. So uh, they contacted me as the only living member of Johnny's crew. And uh, the contact was a fellow named uh, Julian Arahanga, who is a, a movie producer in New Zealand and an actor. Uh, so he phoned me one day and said, are, are you the uh, Tom Thompson that was flew with uh, Johnny Poi. So I said, sure, and he told me what they were going to do, and I said, oh, great, what? I can help you, sure. Uh, send me two tickets to New Zealand and I'll be on your doorstep. Anyway, he said, well, well not so fast. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll do an interview in, uh, and film it in your own home. So there's a couple of girls here that ran a business called Stream Media. Yes. Uh, they came to the house and oh, Arahanga had sent them uh, a list of questions to ask me and get some of the story. So we, we did that, and it worked out really good. He was really pleased with the work the girls did. And I kept, he'd phone ever so often and say, uh, you're going to live in, uh, if you come over, you're going to live in uh, the motel in a village town called uh, Tahapi in the center of New Zealand, of the North Island. So I kept at him every time he'd phone me about, uh, where's my tickets, you know? <laughs> and I finally got around to saying, we're working on it. And then uh, New Zealand there started a direct route a flight from uh, Vancouver to Auckland. Wow. So they provided two first class seats for Gene and I to go to New Zealand for the premiere showing of the movie, the documentary. Anyway, we had a great trip to New Zealand. The family treated us really good. Uh, in wherever we went. The train, uh, are you familiar with New Zealand? Yeah, I was there five years ago. Yeah. Oh yeah. We had tickets uh, for this train in a car, there just the two of us, and uh, a couple who were executives of the railway company, and a prisoner. A prisoner. A prisoner. <laughs> well, he was in the back of the car. We didn't know who he was at that time. But I soon discovered what he was. Well, anyway, uh, the train uh, is a direct route from um, Auckland to Wellington. Right. And it only has three stops, but to Happy was not one of their stops, but it stopped for us. Uh -huh. The first time it had happened in the history of that air <laughs> train. <laughs> so uh, the family were all there, and, and we, we stayed in, uh, in a motel there. My grandson was going to university in Griffith, Australia, okay. near uh, 
Brisbane? Yep. So he, his father Flew. gave him the ticket to fly over to be with us. So we had a great time in that. Uh, in the, it's a small place, but uh, there were two restaurants. They told us you just go there and sign the chit for meals. Oh, and they had a, an old theater there, like the Monarch yep. Theater here, that they had. They were going to destroy it, and this we met the gal that bought the place. She said <laughs> she couldn't see this building being destroyed. So for the premiere showing, they had a red carpet that was throughout the th on the street in the front and through the the doors. And it came from the, uh, what movie did they make in New Zealand? Um, Lord of the Rings? Oh, the Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson, yes. Yeah. That's where that red carpet came from. So they don't waste anything. No. So the, uh, the theater, the demand for the tickets was unbelievable. I think they showed it uh, six times or something in the next six days. Wow. And people were coming from all over the place to see it. Wow, local boy makes good. Yeah. Well, his family farm was just outside of the town. Yeah. They had, the Maoris have some different uh, approaches to things. Um, the family said when Johnny was shot in Germany, they wanted everything in the house to stay as it was. So we were in the house and the the fireplace was one of those where you, you do the cooking on yep. in the fireplace. Everything was the same as when Johnny left to go overseas. Wow. Yeah, remarkable. We were uh, invited to uh, a ceremony they call the bringing the spirit home. And it's like a, a funeral service. And it's held in a, a fenced area. And I think they call it something like, not Maori, but M-A, I can't think of it. But in one corner is a stage. And then there's an area, uh, then a, a community uh, center. And then chairs were, benches were all around. And uh, I was invited to be in the, in the front row. My wife was uh, somewhere back there. And my grandson, they were back there. But these people would get up and, and speak in Maori. And I said to the Julian, was, I was with him. I said, is that scripted? Because these people would just go on and on. He said, no, it's right off the top of their heads. It was amazing. Then they put on a great big dinner in the thing. The girls were, he had a young brother who lives in Boulder City, Nevada. Oh. Still there. 
uh, he brought eight of his crew from Nevada and from Australia to the thing. And they were all on the stage. And New Zealand women love fur coats. And it was just this is uh, April, May. They're all in fur coats. <laughs> and some of the the clothes were the clothes that the family wore when Johnny left town on the train, yeah. in the train station, the same clothes. And one of Johnny's cousins, I think, played the part of, his fa of Johnny's father. Okay. And it's just a remarkable uh, experience being with, with the the Maoris, yeah. So how long did you spend in New Zealand? Uh, three weeks, I guess. Wow. Yeah. Stayed in uh, Auckland and uh, Tehapi and Wellington and then Rotorua. And this courtesy of the Poe family and the B and B we stayed in in Rotorua was a fantastic place. Three hundred a night if you. New Zealand is not a cheap place to no. visit. Oh, no, oh no. The family must have been really pleased to have somebody who was with. Oh yeah, the Johnny they were, the end. They were treating me as. Uh, Something special. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Tom Thompson. It's been a very pleasant conversation. Pleasure to be with you, Ian. And I'd like to thank you for watching A Century of Service, Stories of Alberta's Military History.